Is it still sharing? Okay. Okay. I hope uh, everybody is uh, fresh again. And um, maybe first we can uh, check uh, any new questions that arose during the break. Otherwise, we start with the processing. Okay. So, um, what we can do now is uh, use the processing wizard. And uh, since we have all been playing around a little bit with the processing wizard, I want to go back with you to the um, to the default. So uh, what we're gonna do is we close the processing wizard. So please, everybody, uh, just uh, click on the X and uh, then open the processing wizard again. So uh, just click on the menu item and uh, yeah, click on a processing wizard or use the key code combination with control and W and uh, open the processing wizard. So um, now we have to um, yeah, set our experimental setup that we actually used. We talked a little bit about all the parameters and um, now I want to show you like how you actually would optimize or start optimizing the processing wizard for your individual data set. So um, I know that these samples were run uh, using a UHPLC system. So I'm gonna select the UHPLC and I know that uh, they were acquired using an Orbi trap and I know that they were acquired using DDA, data dependent acquisition. So um, now we can, uh, yeah, go uh, go through here. And uh, since we already looked and uh, have the data imported, I will just uh, show you one thing. So uh, going back into the raw data overview, um, we can see that, or we already talked about it, we don't have too many points per feature. And um, so uh, we have to find out if it's good to apply smoothing or if it's not good to apply smoothing for this data set. So uh, by now we just leave it enabled, but um, yeah, we will keep that in mind and say, okay, maybe we have to disable it or not. Then uh, to set up the retention time range, we can go to the raw data overview and we can see, okay, here in the beginning, there was uh, actually nothing injected until 0. Point, I think four, six minutes or so. So the first uh, scan, uh, wait, the retention time should be here somewhere. Base peak intensity. Mm. There. So the uh, the first scan is uh, here start at zero, of course, but like the first scan where we actually have some intensities is like at uh, 0 0.47 or 0 0.46. So we can keep that value in mind and we go to the crop retention time and we type 0 0.46 uh, into the first field. So the feature extraction will begin at 0 0.46 minutes. And uh, then our run was, I think it wasn't 30 minutes long. And we also included uh, a washing step. So uh, you can see back here, uh, there's nothing like uh, meaningful eluting anymore. And uh, I know that most of the time when you switch back from like a uh, high uh, organic back down to uh, high water content, you probably get like this signal here. Yeah, this looks like a sodium formate pattern. So we can say, okay, we stop at 13 minutes. So uh, our feature, so because at 13 minutes we get the water, so we are re-equilibrating the column. So the re-equilibration step is not important for us. So we can say, okay, 13 minutes was the end of our acquisition. So we type 13 in here. And the rest, we leave it as it is because uh, that's like the individual steps that I want to go through with you. The Orbit trap, um, yeah, maybe there, there's one thing that we want to adjust which is the minimum feature height because we have a lot of data. And um, for now, I would say we put this at 1E7. And I think it's um, important that you put a capital E in there. So no small E, but a capital E. And the rest we also uh, leave as it is. 
everybody so far? Okay. Then uh, going next to the filters. So as I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, for optimizing, we want to look at our intermediate results. To, and to keep the intermediate results, we um, go to the original feature list uh, in the filters tab. And from remove, we uh, put it to keep. So in here, we will, uh, yeah, this uh, setting will keep every individual step and we can look at the intermediate results to optimize our uh, feature detection. The rest we leave as it is. Everybody fine? Good. Uh, in the annotation tab, we do nothing. So um, it should be completely blank, nothing in there. And for the data dependent uh, acquisition tab, we just uh, remove the checkbox with the export path. So because we're just uh, like optimizing at the moment, we don't want to generate any export. So uh, yeah, remove the check mark uh, with the export path. So there is uh, no check mark at all. Yeah. Uh, switching polarity, yeah. Um, you can process the data with MZMine, uh, but I would say it's a more advanced uh, approach to processing because for that you have to do like some manual, um, some manual steps in, or like some manual parameter adjustment in between. Um, I can show you uh, how it works, or we can just talk in the break uh, how to do that. But I think like for this, uh, like in the in the setting here. I think it, we would just uh, like confuse uh, a lot of uh, people, and uh, but yeah, you can do that. You can also process polarity switching data. Uh, I have the same issue because we came from the same school, and uh, I have the same question in the uh, Prague workshop yeah. to Daniel. Yeah. And Daniel strongly suggests me stop e using switching mode because you are killing the instrument. This, although these instruments are designed that you can do switching mode, his experience is that you can kill the instrument. So the, he has seen already orbit traps being damaged by switching too much switching mode. Yeah. Um, also on a similar note, we have a Agilent uh, TOF and uh, it also says, yeah, you can do polarity switching positive negative within one second cycle time or so. And uh, at uh, the technician was at our place and he was like, yeah, never do polarity switching. It kills the instrument. So uh, even the technicians from the manufacturers say, don't do it. Uh, it's possible, yes, but uh, like the power supplies, they are not made for it. So uh, if you like, uh, if you don't have a, a service contract uh, and you uh, yeah like to keep your bill low, then uh, don't do polarity switching. Do two separate runs with both polarities. It will get, give you like more meaningful data anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the, the question was uh, why I select uh, DDA here and uh, not DIA. So, and what the difference is. Um, so in data dependent acquisition, the uh, instrument um, so, uh, like isolates uh, or like data dependent and data independent uh, are about uh, the acquisition of MS2 spectra, so fragmentation spectra. And um, what the instrument uh, does is it looks at, uh, in, in one spectrum, it looks at the most intense compounds and uh, it will um, uh, select the precursors which you want to fragment. And uh, so this one. Uh, really hard to do it without a mouse. So um, now I, of course, sort it after precursor intensity, which does not make sense. So, OK. So um, for example, in this spectrum, uh, the instrument selected uh, 360, 388, and uh, like these um, yeah, precursor masses to fragment. And this is a data dependent acquisition because the instrument looks at the spectrum and says, okay, these compounds are intense and these compounds I want to fragment and I haven't fragmented them yet. In data independent acquisition, 
you don't isolate um, like a, a singular compound or a singular mass to charge ratio, but you fragment a lot of compounds at the same time. So uh, for example, either you, um, you fragment the whole mass range. So either you don't apply collision energy or you apply collision energy, or you can say, okay, I fragment, let's say from 50 to 100 MZ and then from 100 to 150 and uh, stuff like that. Um, it depends on like uh, what kind of sample you're using. So uh, I always do data dependent acquisition because I think the like the spectra are more meaningful. But uh, for example, proteomics field, uh, they all do data independent acquisition because they need like so much more MS2 spectra. And um, it, uh, I would say it complicates the downstream analysis. Um, in MZ mine, we have something now to also process uh, data independent mode. So you can also yeah, build MS2 spectra for data independent acquisition. But uh, yeah, this data set was with uh, data dependent and so we use data dependent. Um, okay, so we have this set up and uh, the only thing that's left is the data tab. Unfortunately, we can not drag and drop this. So uh, we have to go back to our local uh, data set and uh, I'm also going to do it. So I go to the data, I go to uh, the sample I wanted to process, which was the 2018 underscore 19A. So this one, and I drag and drop it in here. So um, uh, this time, yeah, uh, one thing to note, I uh, did not drag and drop it into the left side. Uh, as we did before to import it. Now I drag and dropped it into the wizard, into the data. So uh, I just used the file and uh, dropped it down here. Okay. And uh, if you have it uh, duplicated, then I would, uh, yeah, remove the duplicate. Yeah. Uh, the filter settings, yeah, sure. So it, or we trapped, okay. So uh, the only thing I changed in the Orbitrap setting was to uh, put the minimum feature height to 1E7. But this is just for optimizing. Don't, don't write it down to uh, like to do with your data. This is really data dependent. So uh, yeah, just, uh, just for now, for the optimization, we will start with 1E7. So does everybody have like uh, at least one data file in here? I would recommend to not do this with the full data set. If you have the full data set, uh, yeah, in here you can press Control A and delete everything and just put in one file. You can do two files if you want, but uh, for now, uh, I used this file. Everybody so far? Do I have to wait for anyone? Okay, so um, now this is um, like uh, where we can start with. So now we press the Create Batch button up here in the, in, in the corner. Maybe I'll just uh, change my uh, mouse so you can definitely see the cursor. Maybe I should have also done that in the in the break. Yeah. Oh, I hope no one. Ah, there it is. Let's say pink. Great. And make it a bit bigger. So now. Uh, yeah, now you can see that thing properly. <laughs> so, uh, beautiful. Uh, we go uh, to the Create Batch button and uh, we click on the Create Batch button. And uh, this is what I've been talking before. Uh, this is basically every individual processing step that you do in MZ Mine. And uh, if you have a colleague that told you, man, I never use MZ Mine, it's way too complicated, I totally get that because before, you had to set up every individual step in here on your own. And it uh, yeah, might be a bit complicated. Now, the, um, the, uh, the wizard will create like what we recommend as a workflow. So it will put all the steps in here that we say, okay, you should have at least this. And uh, you can then add something yourself as well. So on the right side, we can see our processing queue that the wizard created. And uh, for example, uh, we had some questions before, like uh, like how do the parameters influence each other and like what I put in the wizard, how does it turn out in the end? So um, if we look at, for example, the ADAP chromatogram builder, if we double click it, so I was too fast again. So I just go to the ADAP chromatogram builder and I just double click and I, now I click too much. So it's uh, gone to the background. So 
uh, in the ADAP chromatogram builder, we can, for example, see the minimum consecutive scans of four, and we can see um, the minimum absolute height of one uh, E7 that I set. And uh, before we were talking about like how does the um, minimum consecutive scans and the minimum absolute height, how does how do they influence each other? In here, uh, there's also like uh, this is this is basically how each of these four scans, like what sh what intensity they should have. And this is basically one fifth. You can alter that if you optimize it. But uh, for now, like MZMind calculates like a meaningful default value and uh, you can just leave everything as it is. So uh, if you have this window open, just uh, go down here and press the OK button and uh, to close it again. And then, um, yeah, I would say for now we just, uh, oh yeah, one thing. Um, this will take long. So uh, if you scroll down in here all the way to the MSMS spectral networking, I would say we just remove this. Uh, and to remove it, uh, we select it. So uh, just click on it once. And uh, you can uh, press the uh, two arrows that are pointing to the left in the middle here, where my mouse is at the moment. So we can remove the MSMS spectral networking because like for now, it will just take way too long to process. And uh, we don't need that for optimizing. Stefan, what, what would be your suggestion if you want to include another step in the batch? Yeah. So how how people can think where I put it right in the right place that I'm mm -hmm. not getting an error because this is yeah. something that it happens to to uh, yeah. to everybody at some point. Yeah. So uh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the question was like where to imp or where to use extra steps. Like, uh, for example, if you uh, want to do some blank filtering or so. And um, so what I would recommend is there is a protocols paper coming out soon that will have this figure. I don't know if we have already used this figure on the, I think we use it already on the MZMind documentation. So for example, you can do to, uh, you can go, if you Google just MZMind documentation, I have it down here. So, um, you should be like when you are in here, you can go to the uh, workflows and you can go to the untargeted LCMS workflow. And in here you will have like this figure and there you can know, or like this is this, the, the place where we would recommend to use additional modules. So uh, for example, we don't have um, like for, if we don't have spectral library matching in here in our batch, then we can see, okay, we apply it after the alignment and after the gap filling. So uh, we can then uh, go to MZMine and here on the left side, we can search. So I can, uh, 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 you know, I just search for spectral and then I have the spectral library search. I double click and I can configure it, but we're not going to do that now, just an example. And then uh, afterwards in here, you can like uh, drag and drop the modules around so you can put them in the correct order. So, but what I was going to say, so the MSMS spectral networking, we want to remove it. So we just press the two arrows to the left and now we have removed it from our batch. And uh, now we're fine. And now we can press the okay button. And uh, I think uh, like one question might be, what happens if the file is already imported that I selected for the batch uh, and MZMine recognizes that and it doesn't import the file again. So then it will just use the uh, currently existing file, but MZMine has to know like which files you want to process. So that's why we put it in the data tab. So now we press OK. And um, now the processing is going to start. And if I put uh, click like down here on our task or like up here in the task tab, we can see the individual steps being like processed. And you can see that, uh, I don't know, my laptop is like a regular consumer laptop has 16 gigabytes of RAM and I don't know what, how many cores even, but uh, you can see it like this one file was pretty fast. And if we now go from our MS data files to our feature lists uh, tab, or like who is still processing? Okay. So then it's already finished probably. So if it says no running tasks, then it's, uh, then it's already finished. So uh, then we can go to our feature lists um, and then we can see all the intermediate feature lists that were created during the processing. And, sorry? Okay. 
uh, we can see all the intermediate feature lists that were created during the processing. And uh, these are sorted in the way they were created in. So at the bottom, you can see the first feature list. And uh, then the next feature list gets a suffix. So it, uh, the SM stands for smooth. Then uh, uh, the next suffix, the R, stands for resolved. And uh, the next one is the, the isotope feature list, and so on. And um, now we can first, uh, um, so uh, we had uh, the question, for example, with low intensity metabolites. So uh, if I was um, uh, yeah, going to optimize my batch for specific low intensity metabolites, I would first open now the feature list with the EICs. That just uh, double click it, it might take some time to open. And then uh, I get a list that should look like this. Does it open for everybody? Okay, so, and now uh, we can see, uh, like we can see the list, we can uh, scroll down here a bit and we can uh, like look through the features. If we want, we can, for example, also sort the feature table. So uh, we can expand this a bit and say, okay, I want to see the most intense features first. So uh, yeah, I sort them after descending height. So um, yeah, I have the most intense features at the top and the lowest intense features at the bottom. And um, what I now like, uh, what like what do we see here, for example, in uh, the first uh, chromatogram? Uh, is it just a singular feature? Is it uh, actually two peaks, right? So uh, we don't want to represent like these two peaks by the same uh, like. Um, ID or by the same uh, by the same feature in the feature table. So actually, we we know okay, like this first compound, it's actually like two separate or like the first feature, it's two separate compounds because we have two signals in the retention time dimension. So uh, ideally, we want to say okay, we want to like for for example, we want to look at the MS2 spectra for the first one, and we want to look at the MS2 spectra for the second one. So uh, what we have to do is uh, to resolve the features and also to maybe smooth them. So uh, we can now check, okay, how does the smoothing affect uh, the features? And um, uh, so uh, when I look at this one, I can see, uh, so wait, how, do, how did I do that? Or what did I do? Sorry. It's always, it's, it's always a journey, not just for you, but also for me, what I'm doing here. So. Um, we can, uh, if we want to get a bigger view of uh, the chromatogram, for example, we can say uh, right click, show, and then XIC. And uh, there's a, the option XIC quick in brackets. So we can just click on that. And then we get the full chromatogram across the whole retention time range uh, for that mass to charge ratio. And uh, in this plot, we can, again, as we did before, we can zoom in. We can see, okay, we have like some noise in here, and uh, but on that noise, we have like a lot of different signals. And um, what uh, we can check is, okay, like how many points do we have per peak? Um, we can say one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's a lot already. If we look at the smaller signal down here, we would probably just have three data points. And uh, so this is like what we have to adjust our uh, our parameters to. So um, yeah, we keep that in mind for later. And uh, as I said before, did anybody like or did everybody who did this uh, use the same data file as I did, or did you use like completely random data files? Did anybody use a random data file and not mine? Nice. Um, so uh, I picked. I, I picked out an example feature, and uh, I hope this worked now. So it's the 675.42, uh, and um, you can you don't have to search for that manually. We have down here, we have the search bar, so we can go 675.42, great. Uh -huh. Let me double check my presentation. If I made a mistake while copying. 675.42, that's too bad. How intense, oh, uh -huh. it's uh, so uh, I gave you the wrong parameter. I said 187 because I was like, okay, 
we get one e seven will be fine, but it's just not nine point two in intensity. So, uh, as I said, it's also a journey for me. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, we right click onto this feature list, up, or like uh, on all the feature lists. So on the top one, and we say remove. Because, uh, for example, like this is basically how you optimize. You say, okay, I have my benchmark feature, and I didn't find what I was looking for. Now, uh, even like in the first step, it didn't work. So now we say, okay, we have to redo this. We remove uh, all feature lists. So uh, click and uh, right click and remove feature lists. And then we go back to the processing wizard. And in the processing wizard, we go to the orbit trap and we say, okay, one E7 was too high. So we go five E6 now, because then we definitely uh, get that feature. And uh, in case you close the processing wizard and open it again, you also have to put the file back in here. But uh, yeah, I hope you didn't close it. And uh, one thing that we can do is, um, hope I'm not too fast, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, um, so the question was, isn't it easier to modify it in the batch mode? And uh, in theory, yes, if it, uh, if like the one E, uh, like the one E7 just affected like one module. The thing is, uh, in my batch mode, the one E7, oops, uh, is, so it's in the ADAP chromatogram builder and it's also in the feature resolver. So I would have to go through all of these modules to search it. So uh, now for me, it's just easier to say, Okay, uh, I go to the orbit trap. I say, okay, I just go with 5e6. And um, what, I, what we did before is we removed the spectral networking. So in the DDA tab, I just uh, yeah, remove this check mark. And then I click on create batch again. Yeah? Uh, quick question because it didn't work for the three of us now. Um, can you quickly explain the input of the file again? Because we yes. all get an error of that the file is not supported. Somehow. What kind of uh, file do you have? Huh? Like, if you go to the annotation and try to upload the file, like if I put the file in it sh it, and I start it, it says yeah. that yeah, it's not supported. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the raw data file that we are using, it's an MZML file and only contains raw spectra. So uh, we want to put it into the data, but uh, not into the annotation. So um, the annotation is only for spectral library files. So what you use to annotate your processing results, but um, yeah, the raw data goes into um, yeah the data. So um, after so let me uh, reiterate. We put the um, data in here. We uh, set the orbit trap is five uh, e six. The fi filters are all set to keep. This is really important for now. And um, the DDA, we disabled the spectral networking and we disabled the export part. And now we're just going to set um, the create batch again and press OK. So we don't need to remove anything now. Yeah. Uh, did you put the uh, data into the data tab? Can you uh, check? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, it uh, it doesn't do anything if you uncheck it. So it doesn't even put it in temp storage. It just doesn't export. Uh, yeah. So, uh, oh, uh, you mean if you can drag and drop a whole folder in there? Um, you can, uh, so as you, you can, we have all these buttons uh, here on the side. You can say uh, all from folder or so, but uh, you can also, like, if you, are, if you are in here, you can also select everything and drop everything in here. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are multiple files and you just put a, like a folder name. Uh, 
Carlos, are you able to get it to work or? In a error saying that the data is duplicated so that he- Oh yeah. Add... Yeah, so right. if you have the, um, the, uh, the data file in here in the data tab twice for him. It's not like, it's not twice. Okay, so uh, create batch and press OK. So uh, we can see now when we just look at the feature lists, we can see MZMine doing like the individual steps and uh, yeah, creating new feature lists all the time. So now we can cross our fingers, open the EIC's feature list and go to 675. And uh, now we have the 675.42, yeah. Oh yeah, sure, sorry. So uh, down here, I uh, just put the uh, 675 in and uh, now we have like two different features and we are all actually looking for the 675.42. And uh, why did I like actually look for this one? So if I yeah open the chromatogram, we can see uh, that these are like two very closely co-eluting features and they are not baseline resolved. So uh, this is like a really good example, like uh, what we have to do to optimize our batch. And uh, if we uh, do the same thing, so uh, we can like close the, all the intermediate feature tables. Um, does everybody, like, th did everybody run the batch the second time and has the 675 uh, feature, like, uh, in the ESC's feature list? So um, what we can do now is we also open the uh, smoothed feature list. So uh, the second one from the bottom, which is called EIC's uh, yeah, space SM. And we again type 675. And uh, then we um, say right click and uh, show the XIC for this specific feature. And uh, we can see, okay, um, the, uh, so why is it different here, right? So we can see that the, uh, the black um, feature or like the black uh, area is different from the line. So what's ha what has actually happened in here? So um, we, uh, like in between these two feature lists, the smoothing step was applied. And uh, what the smoothing did was, uh, yeah, take a running average across the data points and uh, yeah, to make everything smoother. But we can also see that we uh, kind of destroyed the valley in between these two signals in here. So the smoothing for uh, a data set with so low, um, yeah, uh, with so low MS1 acquisition rate uh, might not be that applicable. Does anybody agree or disagree with that? Okay. Uh, I, ho I hope uh, I'm kind of making sense here. Uh, are there problems uh, anywhere or? Regarding the setting the cores that use the machine. So when you use the full cores of the machine, the machine is completely yeah, yeah. crashing. Yeah, um, maybe that's uh, something I can highlight. So uh, if you want, uh, like basically MZMind tries to use all the processing cores. If you want to change that, you can um, go to project and you can 
go to set preferences again, as we did before. And under the general um, setting, we have um, the number of concurrently running tasks. And by default, it uh, just uses all your CPU cores, but you can also say, okay, I want to set this manually and I don't know, want to use all yeah, 16 or eight cores, but I just want to use 10 or so. And then MZMine will only run 10 tasks and like use less battery and you can do still like the stuff on your machine, but you don't have to do that at the moment. So um, then looking at uh, the uh, resolved feature list, so uh, we can close the smooth one, but now we look at uh, the third feature list from the bottom, which is the, uh, like with the suffix uh, SM uh, uh, space R, and we open this one. And now we go into the 675. And uh, we can see that we only have one feature. And that's bad. Because uh, for the 675.42, we before we clearly saw that there were two signals. And now we just have one signal. So in this step, something went wrong. Our settings weren't quite right. So um, what we can do to optimize this is uh, like first find out like which step actually like uh, or like which module or which processing step actually did this. And uh, for that, we can um, open the batch. We can go to project. We can go to batch mode. Uh, so uh, project to batch mode. Also uh, control B is the uh, key combination for that. And um, it's the uh, local, oops, it's the local minimum feature resolver. So this one, uh, it will look for valleys in between your peaks and uh, split them into individual signals. And uh, this one was the actual issue in here. So um, what we have to do is uh, optimize this step to make it work properly with our representative feature. So uh, how do we do that? Um, if you have the newest MZMine version, let me double check, yes. Oops. Control, uh, um, so what we do, is uh, either you can uh, like uh, go through all the menus and find it, or you just press Control F and you get this uh, small pop-up. And in here you can say, uh, just uh, you have to type LOC and you already get the local minimum feature resolver. So um, press Control F, search for LOC, local minimum feature resolver, and then just uh, press enter or double click and then you get the setup window for the local minimum. If you are not here yet, please raise your hand because this is really important. I want everybody to be able to follow. Um, yes, but the preview doesn't work then. So uh, don't go through the batch now, but go through um, like a control F and search for this window. Because we really like uh, one thing great in MZ Mine is that you can, for most of the steps, look at a preview, what the parameters will do with your data. And that really gives you the option to optimize everything in particular. So, uh, everybody at this window? No? Um, uh, control F and then uh, search for LOC. So, uh, let me just do the same again. So I press Control F and then I type LOC and we have the local minimum feature resolver. Anybody else uh, still? Okay. So uh, what do we do now? Uh, we select the uh, show preview uh, checkbox. Uh, it's kind of hard to see it, but down here in the bottom, you can select show preview and then it will uh, open like two plots on the side. Okay, and in here we can say, okay, I now want to use the feature list that is uh, smoothed or I just can use the EICs. And I think, uh, I hope we all agree that smoothing might not be applicable. So uh, in the, like uh, for our optimized batch, we will not do the smoothing. So we'll, we will apply the resolving to the EICs list in here. So uh, we click on feature list and we select the EICs and then MZ Mine will already um, yeah, open this window and uh, select like a good feature and a bad feature. 
So for example, at the top here, you have like, you can see something really, uh, really, I would say it's a clear chromatographic noise, some compound that eludes from the column the whole time. And um, on the bottom, we have a good feature, which uh, yeah, is actually the one that we were looking at before, not the particular one I want to look at with you uh, together, but something similar. So, uh, and to find our uh, 700 and, uh, 675, we can uh, here at the bottom sort uh, by MZ. So click on the, uh, check, uh, on the combo box here at the sort and select MZ. Thumbs up. Okay, select MZ. And now uh, this list here, the second from like the middle list, is sorted by master charge ratio. So now uh, I just uh, like use the scroll thing here on the side and I go to find uh, the 675.42. There are two features at MZ 675 and we want to use the one at 675.42. Thumbs up again, anybody, okay. So we select this one and uh, now our preview should update. And uh, in here we can already see, okay, with, um, that's kind of a bad example now, but uh, with, uh, without smoothing, we already resolve the feature correctly. And um, what I want you guys to do now is uh, please um, play around with these parameters a little bit and uh, let's say come up with uh, yeah an optimal set of parameters. And uh, I'm not going to say uh, anything what uh, what uh, these parameters mean, but I just want you to play around and experiment. You can use the tooltips. So if, for example, if you use um, your mouse cursor and you hover it over the name of the parameter, it will give you something and um, what it means and uh, yeah. Uh, I want you to play around like how much, how, for example, how far can you uh, turn this one up? How far can you turn this one down? And how does it influence the results? And uh, yeah, I want you to focus on the minimum search range. And I also want you to focus on the chromatographic threshold. And uh, yeah, I gi I'll give you five minutes and then I'll ask you again, like what you experience and don't just look at the, um, the bottom feature, but please also look at the uh, the one on the top. Okay. So please just uh, play around a little bit, and I'll do the same. How long is the session again? <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. Half past twelve. Okay. Sounds good. Plus minus five minutes, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it should be fine, but maybe I need a bit longer, maybe not. It's a journey, you know? So yeah, please experiment a little bit. See how like, um, yeah, how this influences your results. You can't uh, like uh, break anything in here. Yeah.
So, um, I think you, since uh, it's getting louder, I think you've had enough time to play around. Um, so, uh, sorry, memory. Uh, no, that's uh, that, that's fine. It's it's frozen. No, it's uh, no. Everything's good. Um, so, uh, I hope you've had enough time. So, uh, let's uh, start with the minimum search range. So, uh, like, how low can you go? How low is too low? How high is too high? Or like, what happens when you go to the extremes? What happens when you put in, I don't know, a really high number there? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So uh, if you if we for example put one in here, uh, everything is treated as one signal. So uh, which is what we don't want. Uh, what happens if we put a really really low low number in here? Yeah, it doesn't detect the peak. So if we uh, yeah put something really really small, oh, it's. Not small enough, I think. So, uh, but I want to, what I want to stress is, uh, for example, this one here stops early, so uh, it doesn't cover the full area. Uh, did you come up with an optimum value? What uh, worked best for you? Yeah, zero point zero three. Yes, uh, that's also what uh, like uh, I uh, like. Uh, oops, that's one too much. So that's what uh, I also put in here. So with 0 0.03, we uh, cover the whole orange signal and everything's fine. Um, the chromatographic threshold. Did you also, like uh, what happens when you put a really low number? What happens when you put a really high number? What does it influence? I just, uh, like maybe I just put a really low number. So I think 10% or 5% uh, would be a really low number. And we can, uh, like, it doesn't do anything with the bottom one, but it, what really influences is the top one. So if we put 5%, we get a lot of garbage in our uh, really noisy chromatogram. Uh, if I put a higher number, for example, 90%, most of the garbage in the top chromatogram is gone, right? So uh, we don't have any, like, malformed features uh, for the top chromatogram. If we go really, really high, so for example, 99%, then we also lose uh, the bottom, uh, like the features that were previously correctly uh, yeah, recognized in the bottom one. So it's always a trade-off, um, but uh, I think like most of the time, something around 85, 90% or so will be appropriate to HPLC me measurements, yeah? Um, it's, uh, yeah, something like that. So, um, what it does, it looks at all the, uh, intensities in the chromatogram. So in the full chromatogram from start to finish of your measurement, and, uh, it only keeps the 90% of the highest intensity. So it throws out basically. No, sorry, it only keeps a 10% of the highest intensity and it throws out 90% of uh, like the data points with lower intensity. So uh, this in here basically removes most of the signals. And uh, if you think about it, uh, usually in your extracted ion chromatogram, you don't have like signal after signal after signal after signal, but you have like, uh, for example, here in the bottom, you have like three, four, five signals maybe on the same mass to charge ratio. So, uh, uh, but the rest, you just have zeros. So it will remo remove the zeros, but it will keep everything that has like a meaning meaningful value. So, uh, yeah. And you can really see that, for example, if I put on 50 in here, then we keep that uh, garbage there on the top. And uh, this is basically calculated from the minimum number of peaks in a chromatogram uh, that we talked about earlier in the wizard. So. The wizard had uh, this setting in the HPLC tab where we say ma or maximum peaks in a chromatogram. We set it to 15. And uh, this 90% is basically uh, calculated from the 
retention time range and the feature full width half maximum and the 15, uh, no, uh, the number 15. So uh, somehow we do some magic and we come up with the 90%. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, the question was, uh, if you have to do it with every feature or just with the important ones, right? Yeah, so um, you, you have to optimize this in a way that the ones that you know are important for you work. Basically for me, for example, something or that is representative of your data set, I would say. So uh, for example, this data is really complex, so we uh, might like have this uh, something like this occurring really often. So uh, that's why, um, yeah, I would uh, I, I chose this one because we have like two co-loading peaks that are not completely separated. And uh, yeah, if uh, we optimize something on something like this, then uh, I would hope that all the other like similar features are processed in a similar manner. For example, if you have uh, another benchmark feature, for example then uh, I would also check that one. But like for the sake of time here, uh, yeah, check, um, like we check this one and for in your data set, if you have like three or four, then I would check all four, optimize it. And uh, yeah, also check that you don't introduce a lot of garbage on the top here. Do you recommend to do it uh, uh, with the features which are in high abundance or in low abundance? Mm -hmm. Um, that's also a good question. Uh, I would, uh, so the question was, uh, if you want to optimize this with high or low abundant features, ideally I would say both. So, uh, check something that is high intense, check something that is low intense. Uh, for example, in here, if uh, we can, we also use a minimum absolute height. And if we put one E seven, then we filter this out, which is not what we want. So, um, yeah, you have to, uh, sorry, you have to check, uh, like what's applicable. So um, yeah, do this with uh, yeah like a set of your data. Um, then uh, the ratio of uh, top to edge. Should anybody look into this one? So uh, then just tell me what's happening when I put, uh, for example, five in here. We uh, what happens? we still get like one feature for both of them. And that's because like the top edge of the feature and the lowest um, edge of the feature on the right side, it's not going down be uh, below a ratio of five. So if we decrease the ratio to three, it doesn't work. If we decrease it to two, it's fine. If we use 1.7 or so, it's also fine. So um, this can also introduce some noise here on the top. So for example, if I just put 1.1, then we're too low and we end up with this, which is also garbage again, which is not what we want. So it's always finding like what is applicable to your data. So um, this is why I say optimize it to your HPLC method, optimize it to your data set. And then uh, when you have like some meaningful standard and you don't change uh, any of the methods, then it's totally fine and then you can reuse it and do like some control. Okay, does it still make sense? Uh, does everything work out? And if it doesn't work out, then you can look into the individual steps again. Um, yeah, so I think this is uh, what I wanted to show you on this step. So uh, how do we transfer this now from the wizard? So uh, what we can do is either as uh, was recommended before, we can uh, just go to, uh, into the wizard and we can say, okay, I open this feature resolver manually and I can uh, put uh, instead of 0 0.05, I can put in there 0 0.03 or because this is basically just, um, yeah, the full feature full width half maximum, I can also put the 0 0.03 in here for the full width half maximum and then uh, MZ mine will do the rest. So, yeah, uh, the, uh, another thing we found out was uh, we don't want to apply smoothing. So uh, in the UHPLC parameters, 
we remove the check mark in the smoothing uh, in the smoothing box. So uh, we don't apply smoothing, and then everything works better. And um, I think the rest was fine. So we have five e six here. We uh, for our optimized batch, we uh, can say okay. Uh, now we don't want this intermediate results anymore. So when we process everything, uh, we would end up with, I don't know, 100 feature lists, but uh, really we care just about the optimized results. So we uh, press remove in the uh, filters. And uh, then annotation stays the same. Did I lose anyone? Was I too fast? Just checking. The orbit trap, yeah. Yeah, so on the UHPLC, I changed the approximate feature full width half maximum to 0 0.03, which is what we came up with uh, Yeah, from optimizing the parameter in there. And I also removed the check mark in the smoothing. Okay, um, then in the DDA, now we actually want to uh, produce some results. So we uh, check the export path and now we press the select button and then you uh, get this uh, nice window. And in that window, we uh, set uh, up an export. So basically, I'll just put it to my data. You can put it wherever you want. I, I just put it to my data set. And as you can see, uh, as I said, it's not a, it's always a journey. So I also reprocess this one multiple times. So um, yeah, I just call this one hands on now, because we're doing it in a hands on session. And down here, I put something just export you have to wait. Do you have a folder selected for the export? If I have to wait, please raise your hand. Yeah, then I wait. Should I repeat something or? Okay. Meanwhile, they are working, uh, Stefan. So you just did it for one feature. Yeah. What if we are, uh, of course, if you, if I'm doing targeted analysis is I go to my feature and I do all this play with this feature as, as you just played. Yeah. What would you suggest for non-targeted then? Uh, yeah. So uh, I would suggest not doing it on just one feature. Of course, um, yeah, you have to uh, look at, um, yeah, more than one, I would say like 10, 20 or so. And um, the thing is, if you optimize it on one feature, then you can um, maybe, I'll just uh, show that again. So uh, before I go there, uh, in this one, I just say save. And um, you don't have to follow this one. So uh, what would I do when uh, I was actually doing non-target analysis and not just optimizing on one feature? When I uh, select this uh, feature list, and let's say we have this um, yeah sorted in some way, so uh, what do I do? Um, I put in my parameters that I want. And then uh, what I can do is basically move this window up a bit. And uh, in here, I can just like uh, scroll down with uh, my uh, cursors and I can go through multiple features and I can see, okay, does this one lead to garbage somehow? Or so for example, in here, I could be like, oh yeah, maybe I want this one, but probably this one doesn't have enough data points. So maybe I might uh, have to reduce the number of data points um, or uh, yeah, something like that. So always uh, like go through multiple features, check if your parameters are not just applicable to your benchmark feature, but also to other features. So this one's actually quite nice, I think. So uh, we have like multiple signals and uh, we can see in here that probably I should have spent some more time optimizing this batch because uh, with these parameters, we like miss a lot of signals, but uh, that's my task for you when doing your homework, when optimizing your uh, batch, 
that you uh, yeah actually take more time than I did for this workshop. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So don't do it for just one. And the same maybe don't just do it for one bad feature, but also do it like for more than one uh, bad. So uh, we have these uh, this height to area ratio on the top here. And uh, why height to area? Um, basically, this one has a really low height to area ratio. And uh, we use that to detect like chromatographic noise. So for example, in here, we have like one sharp peak, but we have a really high area of the feature because it's dragged out for like 10 minutes or so. Uh, if we look at um, some different uh, signal, which is just really short, we have a really low, a really high height to area ratio. So uh, here you just want to look for features that have like a high to area ratio like this one. So uh, in here you can see, okay, it uh, yeah worked properly. We don't have like any of these uh, zigzag uh, recognized or so. And uh, there you can check, like counter check your parameters for good and for bad features in this way. So um, as I said, we want some results. So now uh, we just delete everything here. And we go in the so we go to the data tab. We delete everything, and now we go to uh, our full samples, our full sample set, and we select everything in this folder. We just press Control A. It selects everything. I hope it's the same key code on Mac. Okay, and uh, then we just uh, drag and drop this over. So now we have like all the sixty files in here. And uh, there's not just a sample folder, but there is also the blanks folder. So we also want the four blanks that we have to be processed with that data. So we just drag and drop that in as well. And we'll, it will add the four blanks at the bottom of our data list. I will just double check. I made no mistake in here. So yeah, we have the export path set. We export for molecular networking. We export for Sirius. Um, yeah, looks good. So now uh, we can create the batch. This uh, batch will then produce like our full results. And you can see that in comparison to before, we also have like these uh, export molecular networking file. And we also have the export for Sirius and we also have the export for annotations. Um, since we don't have any spectral libraries in here, or at least I don't currently in the batch, we won't get any annotations, but that's totally fine. Maybe just for the sake of showing you what you can also do with MZMine is I also put like one annotation file in there. So one small library. It's basically just drag and dropping that in and uh, create the batch. And then I let it process. And uh, then in the task overview, you can see now MZMine is uh, processing everything. Like we are importing all the files. We are applying mass detection. We are uh, extracting the chromatograms. Of course, this might take a bit longer. And uh, of course, uh, I hope your it runs through on all your computers but it might not be, which is also why we have uploaded the um, results to the shared folder. So uh, because especially Marcus with Sirius, he will be um, yeah, looking at uh, the MZMine results and uh, using the exact uh, yeah, uh, export that we're using here. Maybe it's best even if you processed it to also download the results from the shared drive overnight and um, yeah, so we can use that for the remaining steps. So uh, I will do one, yeah, like basically we have to wait for it to uh, process everything. Does anybody have questions or issues while it's processing? Yeah. You have an error message. Um, let me check. Uh, yeah, so this one is probably, so now it should work. Basically we just remove 
we can remove this one. And now just create batch again and then it should run. More questions? More issues? No issues? Man, that's the first. <laughs> Don't feel bad about it. Oh, if yeah, you have errors, it's, okay. it's okay to have errors. In um, this no, you have to go part. down here. It's better to have errors right now. Yeah, then you can ask a step and how I saw it. Yeah. Just right click and say cancel. So for, yeah, right click. Say because then you go home and then you go to the institute and, yeah. and then you and, have uh, the errors. Then and you, you have can go back to the wizard it, so. uh, here and uh, say create batch again and then run it again. Oh, it's running fine. Okay. Uh, I just have a general question. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah, sure. No. Uh, um, it's really hard to compare that. So um, uh, the question was if there is a comparison with other software for uh, optimizing the parameters. And uh, for our MZMI3 paper, the reviewers also asked us, okay, like how does it compare to MS Style? How does it compare to XCMS? And the thing is, uh, I'm not an expert in XCMS and I'm not an expert in MS Style. So I, I can't tell you like how their parameters work. And I also don't want to do a comparison against XCMS because I don't think I can like uh, use the software as it's meant to used as it's meant to be used by a pro or by a like a really expert in XCMS or an expert in MS Dial. So if I did a comparison, it would have the best MZ mine results, but the worst MS Dial and uh, XCMS results. But that's not because the softwares are bad, but that's because I'm not used to these softwares. So uh, yeah, if uh, you as an unbiased user want to do a comparison of the softwares, I think that's like, um, the better way to do it, or like uh, if you really want to compare software and compare results and compare optimization, um, I think that's like a whole PhD thesis or a whole project in itself, because what I think uh, should be done for like comparing these tools is like uh, someone should come up with a data set, come up with like a ground truth of the data set, which is in itself super, super hard and then give it to the developers of the individual tool. So you really have the experts of that tool optimizing the tool. And then uh, you compare the results, not like the experts of one tool compare the results, but you compare it like you know the ground truth and uh, you have to compare like what the, the individual softwares came up with. But I think that's like, I don't know, three years of work or so to properly do that. Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, we don't have, we, we don't use SendWave uh, because we think or like um, it was really slow compared to the resolving we use and uh, the results weren't that much better. So at some point we removed uh, SendWave. Yeah. Based on your data set, right? So you choose three, four, five data files out of hundreds, mm -hmm. and you feed the software or the, yeah. the, the the source code with with these files, and and then you choose ranges for the parameters. Yeah. And it give you uh, what is supposed to be an optimal um, yeah. number for every parameter that you have, right? Yeah. So it's a starting point. It's not ideal, but it's a starting point instead of yeah, because again, the same happens with other software like XCMS. If you're not aware of that, which I don't know if many people are, you start playing around with with your um, with your your values, right, for the parameters. But then there is a lot of um, room for for errors. There, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I yeah. was wondering if you are aware of maybe not within FCMI, but maybe an alternative source of or software that helps you with this parametrization mm -hmm. uh, for MCMI. 
Yeah. Uh, I think. Uh, do you know MZ Rap? MZ Rap. Yeah. So, uh, like, uh, the question was like, uh, can you use like some other tools to optimize the parameters and maybe make them comparable between different softwares? So between different softwares is really hard. I don't think you can do that easily. Uh, to use something to optimize the parameters. So there are different tools out there. I know of MZ Rep. Uh, it's um, you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's uh, called MZ Rep. Uh, this one. And uh, I think it, uh, it's an R tool. You can give it some benchmark features. You can give it some parameter ranges and it will optimize uh, yeah, some parameters for you. I know it works with MZ Mine 2. I don't know if it works with MZ Mine 3. Not too sure. Um, okay, so one thing before we finish the session, uh, because uh, we barely scratched, uh, or we were barely able to scratch the surface in here. So, um, for uh, looking at the actual processing results, uh, when you double click it, uh, you should get an aligned feature table. So when you double, when you go to feature lists and double click the uh, topmost aligned feature list, you should get a feature table similar to this one. And uh, like from here, you can uh, basically look at the chromatograms. Uh, I would recommend you if your laptop is like not super uh, super, super fast to not do this, but uh, I'm going to do this and I hope it doesn't crash. So uh, you can also uh, look at the chromatograms of every feature in every sample. So up here we have like um, the individual features in the different samples. Every chromatogram is uh, colored uh, according to the color that uh, yeah is set for the raw data file here. And uh, also, like the raw data files have a different color up here, uh, like the same color up there. So uh, we try to make everything, uh, yeah, super usable. You can, um, yeah, go through the feature table. You can see, okay, um, like my feature was detected this much, and so on. And uh, yeah, now it's hanging a bit. So uh, one thing I want to also highlight is if you have uh, a spectral library and you can match it. Uh, you can also get spectral library annotations. So um, what we can do with the spectral library annotation, oops, with the annotations is, um, I just sorted it like this, but uh, since you, you don't have a library currently, uh, just like, please follow me up here. So for example, we can like right click and we can say, show uh, spectral database search results. So, and then MZMine allows you to look into the spectral library match, it will give you like if the library contains the structure of the compound, it will give you the structure of the compound. You can see the matched signals, you can see the not matched signals. And uh, what you can also do is uh, like select a different compound and you can see here, okay, we also have a match to nicotine and uh, stuff like that. And from here, you can also, for example, export this as a PDF file if in case you were doing a report. But uh, like, um, if you want to go into this more deeply, uh, then we have a lot of other videos from other workshops on YouTube. You can just search for that, or you can look at the MZ Mine documentation. So, um, one thing that uh, I still want to highlight is what our what are our actual processing results? Like, what do we export from MZ Mine to Sirius or to GNPS or so? And for that. I will shortly open the uh, folder that I exported everything to. So I go to my data folder and I go to the hands-on folder. And in here we have like several, several files. And uh, for GNPS, we need the uh, quant table. So not the quant underscore full, but just the quant. And uh, we, we can say, okay, I want to open this in Excel. So I'll just open this in uh, Excel. And then you can see, basically, it's just a really large table. And uh, we can also get this into a more readable format. So we can actually like interpret something by hand. So to do this, we select the first column, column A. 
And then, of course, this is in German, so you can't properly follow me, but I'll do my best. So we go to uh, we go to data. No. And uh, we go to data and we go to uh, text and columns, I think is the English word. So uh, we go to text and columns and then we uh, get like this dialog. And uh, in this dialog, we uh, have to say it's separated. It's not a, a, a constant width. And in the set, uh, then if we have separated, selected, we press next and we just select comma or yeah, comma. And then uh, it's all done. We can say done. You get, yeah, this is a small issue that might come up sometimes. So basically we just have a large table. We have our ID, we have the master charge ratio. And then we have basically in here on the left, I'll just zoom in a bit. Um, we have the uh, peak area in every different sample file. So basically this is just a really large uh, yeah, quantification table uh, for our for our samples. And uh, if MZMind was able to recognize, for example, some ions, it tells you, okay, this is an M plus uh, ammonium, this is an M plus hydrogen, and so on. And um, then there's also one other important export file. Uh, thing is here, I don't want to save it. If I want to save it, uh, if you save it, then probably JMPS has some problems with it. So uh, don't save it. And uh, go into, let's say, the Sirius.mgf. And uh, this basically contains all the data that uh, Sirius will work with in the end. And you, we can say open with. And uh, in here, we just say we want to open it with the uh, text editor. I'm waiting. Thumbs up if you're this far. I want to see more thumbs before I continue. Good. Uh, and say OK. And uh, basically, in this file, we have our feature ID again. Like before, it was a tabular format. But this time it's basically just like a long, long format. We have our feature ID, we have our adduct in case an adduct was recognized, and we have our individual MS2, our signals in the MS2 spectra. And this is what Sirius can in the end work with to give like few structural annotations and so on to uh, yeah, make sense of your data. And I think this is a good point to end the session. I know there's a lot more of MZMind to do, and uh, it's just way too hard to cover that in even, I don't know, a day, a week, whatever. If you have any more questions, please uh, feel free to ask me. If you have a, spe a specific application, uh, please feel free to come up to me. If, uh, I don't know, uh, your question arises not during the workshop, uh, yeah, open a, go to GitHub, open an issue, ask us something. I can't promise we can reply within a day or so, but uh, at least most of them we are happy to uh, yeah, answer. And uh, yeah, thank you for, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I never thought about it like that. But uh, yeah, you should be able to, or like at least uh, in the export, you should be able to say, okay, I only want like the, a representative uh, feature. So for, for example, the most intense one or so. Um, like uh, what's done or like what we're doing is we are running uh, molecular networking and we're also doing ion identity molecular networking. So in the, in, in the networks, basically all these features will be grouped together. And since we are doing statistics of that, I hope we're uh, like, uh, yeah, I don't know, paying attention to that, but uh, that's a good point, yeah. 
I will uh, I will write that down and uh, keep that in mind for future developments. If I got your question, what you're asking, because you're an XCMS person, I see it. I were yeah, and I was also an XCMS person. So we know that in XCMS we have this reduced feature table. It, it, I think that's what you referred that you can reduce from 6,000, 10,000 features. And when you ask the XCMS, produce me a reduced feature, you remove all the isotopes. And then you have only the most intense peaks, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, yeah. No, you're you're completely right. Uh, redundancy. You have a lot of redundancy. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, we. So uh, what you can see in here, there's also a correlation group ID. So uh, basically this will uh, yeah, group the ions of um, yeah, the same molecule together. So the same ions of the same molecule will have uh, the same correlation group ID. So if you, are, uh, yeah, if you want to filter that out later, you can do it. I would probably recommend to use then the um, the full the quant full feature table because there you have even more information. So uh, as you can see, instead of one megabyte, this one is uh, fifteen megabyte, and uh, it gives you a lot more uh, data to um, yeah filter out that redundancy. And uh, yeah, I think to um, to answer your question, it's not done in MZ Mine currently before uh, in, uh, before the export. You can do it downstream, but it's a good point, and we should uh, like add that to the workflow at least to the to the export to just like export uh, like the most intense or representative feature, so we don't have to deal with that problem, or you don't have to deal with that problem later on, because like it should be easy for us to yeah do that. But thank you for the input. Uh, there was another question. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, I don't have the feature shape. How to enable it? And uh, yeah, in the feature table, uh, we have this uh, small plus up here in the top right. And if you click on that plus, you get like this uh, huge menu. And this is basically also all the types. Oops. Voila. Uh, this is uh, all the types that are also, uh, for example, available in MZMine and then uh, that are also exported in the full quantification table. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to group uh, the, uh, the ions, you would enable the ion identity column and you would also enable, let me check, you would enable the ion identity itself, you would enable the ion identity ID. And the ion identity ID is basically, uh, yeah, what I said before, um, it's the same compound that is uh, grouped together for multiple ions. So for example, here we have the uh, M plus ammonium and we have the M plus sodium um, yeah, feature and it's uh, all in the same IIN ID. So this is what you would look for in the MZ mine export. Yeah, oh, sorry, maybe I could make it a bit larger here and on the side on the plus you need the IIN ID and you also need like the completely full ion identity so you need to enable both of them yeah so it's uh, like it's in here it's just not used in the export so but uh, as as I said like uh, we will I will write that down so we can do it in the next version yeah I I, I would 
I would like to say that I was an ex EMS person before I met me, me, me in the uh, MSET mine. And yes, ex EMS is awesome and uh, it works really good. Uh, and I start comparing with my students the results from both platforms, from both tools. And of, you never get the same results. That's that, forget it, you will never get the same results. So for more that you set up the parameters as similar as possible, you will never get the same results. What is the advantage of MSET Mine, and that's why I'm transitioning all my studies into MSET Mine, I think is the capacity that you have to control and to visualize your data immediately online, and you can select and visualize the change that you do, what is the result on your data, on your, on your selection. I think that's, the, for me, one of the greatest features and characteristics of MSET Mine that worked beautiful for me because when I was doing in the XEMS, you were, I was working on R, so you have to always select, you know, and I'm not an expert programmer, neither an expert on R, so I was struggling sometimes to write the right code to see the output that I want to see, and it was a lot of errors. I think you're saving a lot of time in Epson Mine to set up those uh, features and those parameters for your personal data, because you can see these chromatograms and these mass spectra beautifully there. You can select and visualize, okay, so if I put my threshold here, this is what is happening with my data. So I think this is one of the greatest outputs and you don't have to code anything. So that's also incredibly good. I couldn't have said that better. <laughs> we, we For, for MZ Mine, no, MZ Mine is uh, written in Java. Uh, it's uh, open source. You, it's on GitHub. You can um, uh, you can add your own modules to it. So uh, we have this uh, MZ Mine repository, and um, in MZ Mine three, you can download everything. You can uh, do whatever you want with it. You can uh, add your own modules. We are really happy if uh, you open, for example, a pull request and yeah, propose some change. So, for example, if you uh, want to do the filtering out uh, and uh, do the reduced feature table, we would be super happy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's definitely a feature that uh, yeah we want to uh, work on as well. And as you can see here, like we are really like currently also working on MZ Minor a lot. We are trying to add some simple statistics. We are trying to import results from Sirius. So. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not a dead software. We're really actively like improving it all the time. Yeah. yeah perfect. Thank you, Stefan. I think we have to uh, close the session now. We have to try to get some lunch because now, right now we are twenty minutes uh, uh, in a more from our lunch break, but. It doesn't matter. I think you were all super happy to hear Stefan about this, all the information that he provided us. Thank you very much, Stefan, for all your information. Thank you very much for such a nice talk. Please help me to thank uh, Stefan.